stand to sing. Number 32. Did you notice that twice in this song it mentions the desert? Out in the desert, dark and drear, in, first, in verse 1, and in verse 3, out in the desert, hear their cry. And of course, what we're looking at is Philip going down to the desert in Gaza. It specifically speaks about the desert there. And God does send us out sometimes into the desert areas, things where um, we might not prefer to be, places that uh, might not be as comfortable as what we enjoy here. And of course, it could be very uncomfortable even tonight uh, and the next couple of days. But you know, it is a delight always to be where God wants you to be. And it's there that he gets his blessing to you and where we are able to serve him best. Tonight, money, missions, and divine direction. We saw the desert ministries last week, God sending Philip out into a desert on another evangelistic endeavor. Uh, he had left what would be considered a big success and now is going to a place that he doesn't even know what God is sending him there for. You know, that is a step of faith. That is what Abraham did. Abraham went out not knowing whithersoever he went. We're specifically told that in scripture. That is one of the marks of faith and it's rather interesting that we see that is precisely the same thing that God does with Philip as he goes down to Gaza, which is desert. He went out not knowing where he went. He did not know exactly what God was going to do with him. God gave him general directions and expected him to obey. You know, God has given us his word. There are many specific principles in the word of God. Those are principles that if we obey them, God will give us then clear direction in specific circumstances. And that's what we're going to see tonight as we look at Philip going down into the desert. We noted last week that you and I will not be getting specific, articulate, supernatural, audible manifestations of God today because the scripture has been completed. That was only during the apostolic period that those uh, audible manifestations, such as we find here, where Philip hears the Lord speaking to him, those things were given back before the New Testament was completed. But now you and I have God's direction in his word. And as we obey that direction, 
then we will discover that God will hone in for us as we are obedient precisely what he wants us to do with it. We noted a number of elimination principles for determining the will of God. Very interesting this week, I had a man actually stop by my house, knock on my front door, and talk to him for almost two hours as he was trying to learn what it means to be inside the will of God. How do you determine the will of God? So we sat on the front porch, very pleasant, and uh, talked for those almost two hours. We talked about God's words commands, God's words prohibition. Is it commanded in the word? Is it prohibited? Is there a general principle stated? Does it cause a weaker brother to stumble? Does it dim your testimony before a lost world, even though it might be permissible in the strictest sense? Does it give God glory in a positive manner? Does it edify and build up the church? Is it an appropriate use of the gifts that I have been given, or am I trying to exercise a responsibility or a gift that I do not have? There are many questions that we can use to discern God's will, and all of them are based on Scripture. All of them are based on the Word of God. You and I do not have to go to outside sources, to other types of revelatory manifestations at a charismatic revival or something like that, certainly not to the area of those who are involved in occultic practices. We have God's word which gives to us God's will and as we obey it within the sphere that we understand, we will discover that God gives us then specific direction and that's what God does with Philip tonight. We saw the different methods that God uses to direct us as well, parents, and godly pastors, men of God who are spiritual mentors, but the ultimate test is, does it meet the test of Scripture? The Scripture is, in fact, the final authority. We also noted that as Philip went down to Gaza, he did it immediately. When God told him to start moving, Philip moved. He headed toward Gaza. God didn't tell him which road to go on. But as we noted last week, God worked out the arrangements of a man in a chariot intersecting with a man on foot coming from two different directions and coming at exactly the right speed at exactly the right time so that they would meet at an exact place and an exact event would be taking place as he did. We noted how God has used desert experiences in the lives of many people. We talked about a number of places where it speaks of Moses in the desert, where it speaks of the children of Israel in the desert, where it speaks of Miriam in the desert, where it speaks of Elijah at the juniper tree and at Mount Horeb in the desert. It is so interesting how God brings his people through the desert experiences. There is John the Baptist, he was in the desert. Our Lord Jesus Christ was in the desert, in the wilderness, being tempted by Satan in Matthew chapter 4. Our Lord Jesus Christ takes the disciples apart to a desert place to rest in Mark 6, 31 and 32. And as we look at our desert experiences, the question is, how will we respond to the desert experiences? Will it be a time of growth? Or will it be a time of bitterness? Will it be a time of drawing closer to Christ? Or will it be a time of anger and rejection against him who has brought us there to fulfill his purposes? Good questions as we look at our text tonight. Starting in verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go to the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Gracious Heavenly Father, 
We pray for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. At least 15 different principles that are given to us here in this passage that we're looking at tonight. The first principle is one we have spent a little bit of time on, but that is the principle that immediate obedience receives God's blessing and continued direction. Immediate obedience receives God's blessing and continual direction. God expects us when he gives us a command as he does in his word, that as soon as we know the command, as soon as we understand the command, as soon as we know the correct application of the command, that we obey. It is only those people who refuse to question God, but who say, I see what your word says, I understand what your word says, I believe what your word says, that motivates me to obey what your word says. This morning we were talking about faith, and we pointed out that faith always precedes works, but faith, if it's genuine, always produces works. Faith both precedes and produces works. A life of genuine faith will always result in works of righteousness. As we noted, works of righteousness, works that please God, are works that are in obedience to the word of God. And so if you and I really want to demonstrate faith, we will learn immediate obedience. Our Lord is not impressed when we put on a show of faith, but we are recalcitrant about doing what he has commanded us to do. Think back over this past week. I trust that you have all studied your Bibles over a period of time, that you all at least generally know what the will of God is in different areas of your thought life, of your speech, of your actions, of your habits, your attitudes, and your motives. Do you remember back at any time during this week when you knew what God wanted you to do and you either hesitated or you disobeyed. We call those things sin. Now I know we did not all go through, I can confess that I did not go through this week sinless. I haven't had a sinlessly perfect week, I think, in my entire life. In fact, I know I haven't. Because we are sinners by nature and by choice. As we walk with Christ, we do go through longer periods of time before suddenly we allow the flesh to come in and take over. But we've all thought an angry thought this week or a bitter thought, perhaps a lustful thought. Perhaps we've done something that we knew we should not have done. And God in his mercy has forgiven us as we confessed it. But what God requires us to do is when we know his will, which is revealed in his word, is to obey it immediately, not to drag our feet. If we do that, we'll receive God's blessing and we will receive God's continued direction. The second principle that we see here is God arranges the most important appointments for those who have learned to obey immediately. You see, oh, immediate obedience is the door to other opportunities. Had Philip chosen to disobey or drag his feet, suppose he had eventually gone down to Gaza and to the desert, he might have had an opportunity to speak to somebody else. But he would have missed the opportunity that God had designed for him. An incredible opportunity, as we're going to see in just a few moments. God does give us other opportunities when we miss opportunities that we know he wanted us to take. 
He doesn't just say after the first opportunity, okay, you didn't witness to that person, so therefore I am not going to give you any more opportunities to witness. I'm taking you home now. No, we have a very patient, long-suffering God who does continue to give us opportunities. But folks, if we harden our hearts, if we reject the opportunities that God gives to us, very soon two things do happen. Our spiritual life begins to dry up and secondly, we come under the chastening hand of our Heavenly Father. Yes, Philip would probably have had other opportunities, but he would have missed the opportunity with the Ethiopian eunuch. Yes, God would have sent someone else to the Ethiopian eunuch. We understand that those who are within God's plan of salvation, even when we fail to do what God has told us to do, God will send someone else and he will bless someone else in leading them to Christ. God arranges the most important appointments for those who have learned to obey immediately. The third principle that we see here in this text is that God has a short-range plan and God has a long-range plan which is based on the short-range plan. Here in our text we see that the short-range plan centered on the salvation of one key man. But as we look at the history of Ethiopia, we discover that the long-range plan centered on bringing the gospel to a nation and making an impact several centuries long. You and I never know when we reach out to one person whether or not that person will be key in a long-range plan that God has for reaching a large group of people. I believe this was the story of Dwight L. Moody. I looked for it, couldn't find exactly, but I remember the story. There was a small church that had only a few people in it. Faithful pastor had been there preaching for many years. He was getting old, getting near retirement. There had not been much response. And one evening he gave an invitation for those who wanted to give themselves to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end of the service, a small boy walked forward, took an offering plate off the table in front, set it on the floor and stepped into it and said, I'm giving myself to God for service. And if I have that story correct, that was Dwight L. Moody a key man in leading thousands of people to Christ. We never know when we make an impact on one apparently insignificant person what kind of an impact that will make as God uses that person in his service. The short-range plan centered on the salvation of one key man. The long-range plan centered on bringing the gospel to a nation. And so we need to understand and recognize God's timing and where we are in the context of the short-range and long-range plans that God has provided. Principle number four. God always has key people positioned with authority to open major doors at the right time. We don't always know who those people are. Sometimes they might seem like very unlikely candidates, and I say that in the context of elections coming up. They might look like very unlikely candidates in both parties, but God can change hearts. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. 
God does have, because God is in control of history, God is in control of which people are conceived and born at which times in history, at which times they will grow to maturity, at which times they will be needed to further his specific plan in this world. That's most obvious with our Lord Jesus Christ. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. There was a specific time, a specific point in history, the conception of a specific young virgin, a specific taxation, a specific trip, which ended at precisely the right place, the juncture, just as we have here in Gaza, for a baby to be born to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. We need to remember that we have a God who is in control. He's a God that we can trust and a God whom we can love and a God who always has key people positioned with authority to open major doors in precisely his time. Principle number five. God tends to use people that others might scorn. God tends to use people that others might scorn. This man was a eunuch. Not very highly thought of in most circumstances. We're not told how that came about. He could have been born that way. He could have been in charge of one point of a harem and been emasculated. He could have chosen to do that for his own progress in terms of his political power. We're not told. But he was neither male nor female. We find Jewish males being brought in to the body of Christ in Acts chapter 2. We find as we move farther to Acts chapter 8, where we have seen the first half of the chapter, both men and women. And we find they are half-breeds, half, half Gentile and half Jewish Samaritans. Now here we find one who is neither male nor female, Gentile by birth, Jewish by religion. The gospel is opening up to different groups of people. Here's a man who in the Old Testament would not have been allowed to serve as a priest had he been of the tribe of Levi. Because a man in this condition was not considered worthy to serve before the altar of the Lord and God had made specific rules concerning that. But we find that God is about to bring this one in. What a marvelous privilege God gave to him. God tends to use people that others might scorn. Principle number six. And we need to remember this when we tend to panic about money. God always has key people with financial resources to fund his plans. Not always to fund our plans. But he always has key people with the financial resources that are necessary to fund his plans. It's like the great missionary statesman Hudson Taylor once said, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. When you and I are walking by faith, the scripture gives a promise to us as well. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We know that. And so we're always begging him to sell a few and send us the check. But if it is God's work and God wants it to thrive, God will provide the financial resources that are necessary. 
It relieves us from the worry and the fear of the lack. Here we find a man who is obviously a wealthy man. It tells us he had the charge of all of her treasure. He's a man who is highly responsible financially. He's a man who is trustworthy with the finances of others. He's a man who, if he embezzled funds, would find himself on the chopping block. God has key people with financial resources if he wants to fund his plans. But he does not show them to us until he is ready to execute his plans. So often we're stressed out because of money, but God is not poor. Our stress over money comes from our lack of faith, not from a lack of divine resources. God's timing is perfect. We want the money in the bank, but God wants us to trust him, not our money. You remember we've read this when we were talking about the gift of giving. But a very important principle out of the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8.18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. And there's a purpose behind it. Last phrase of the verse. That he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. It's a reminder to us that God is the resource in whom we must trust and not in our own wealth. Principle number seven. God does not always tell us in advance when the opportunities will be presented or what they are. God did not tell Philip in advance until he actually had the chariot in sight that this was the reason that God sent him. The Spirit said unto him, Join thyself unto this chariot. Now he went an awful long way before God let him know which chariot he was supposed to get in. He might have been going down that road, and who knows, 25 chariots went one way and 25 chariots went the other way. And a bunch of people walked this way, and some guys rode by on donkeys, and other guys rode by on horses. And some of the people were yelling and screaming, and some of the people had sobbing kids and looked like a nice family unit, and maybe I should stop and talk to this family unit. There was one chariot with a man reading the Bible. And that's the one that God told him to join himself to. God does not always tell us in advance when the opportunities will be presented or what those opportunities might be. That brings us to a very important New Testament principle. We have to be always ready to give an answer to every man that asketh us concerning the hope that lies in us with meekness and fear. But you know there's a prerequisite in that verse, that's 1 Peter 3.15. The prerequisite is this, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready. Did you get that? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready. If you have not set apart the Lord God in your heart, if you are not in the center of his will doing right now what he has commanded you to do right now, you'll miss the opportunities when they come by. It's not just an external sanctification where you are looking holier than thou, where you are going through the rote motions of what it is like to walk the mechanical Christian life. It says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. He's the center of your affection. He's in control of the seat of your emotions and the seat of your will. You are sensitive to the one who holds the reins. 
but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready. Always. Now, I don't know about you, but always to me sort of sounds like 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the month and every day of the year. You are always prepared, semper paratus. You are always prepared. There's never a moment when you are not prepared. Being prepared means that you are alert and attentive to the direction that God gives you, to the contacts that he brings you in touch with, to the question that you hear, to the comment that is made, so that you might step in with the truth of Jesus. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you. The Ethiopian eunuch asked Philip a question. Is the prophet speaking about himself or is he speaking about another man? What an open door! Would you have been ready to take Isaiah 53 and point that man to Christ? Now you and I have the whole New Testament. Philip didn't have the New Testament. Philip had Isaiah the prophet. But he knew the word of God. And he knew that this pointed to Jesus. God requires us to use what we have. And you and I have so much more in terms of New Testament revelation than Philip had. Principle number eight. God prepares the heart and he prepares the lives of those whom he's chosen to serve him even before they know that that is what is happening. God prepares the heart and God prepares the lives of those whom he has chosen to serve him even before they know that is what is happening. Did you notice that phrase in the text? This eunuch had come to Jerusalem for to worship. God was preparing this man's heart. God was directing his life. He didn't know yet about the Messiah. But God was so working in his heart and so working in his life that he had motivated him not to fly from Addis Ababa to Jerusalem or Tel Aviv and take a cheroot down to Jerusalem. He had motivated him to get in a chariot and ride hundreds of miles in a chariot in very unpleasant conditions to go to Jerusalem for a specific purpose, for to worship. God prepares the hearts and God prepares the lives of those whom he's chosen to serve him even before they know what is happening. This is a man whose heart was ready. This is a man who was ripe, who was prepared, who was in the right attitude to hear and understand the word of God. He had been to Jerusalem, but he had not gotten the answer to Isaiah 53. He had been to the city of the great king, but he did not know what this passage meant. He had been to the place where Jesus himself had been. And the apostles had returned to Jerusalem. But God did not choose to use one of the apostles who was in Jerusalem to tell this man about Christ. Do you see the irony of that? Philip and the apostles were both up there in Samaria. It says the apostles returned to Jerusalem. And then the Holy Spirit gave a message to Philip, head south. Now he was traveling a lot slower than the eunuch. The eunuch was in a chariot and he was walking. The eunuch was traveling faster than Philip because it says when the Spirit told him to join himself to the chariot, Philip had to run to catch up to the chariot. God did not use the apostles. 
for the Ethiopian eunuch. He used Philip. Dear people, that means that he can use you too. He may not use this preacher. He may use a child or a teenager or an older person or a middle-aged person who just thinks of themselves as, well, I'm just a church member. God prepares the hearts. Here's a man who was ready. This man was a Gentile who at some point had heard the Old Testament in his life and had converted to Judaism. It's the only reason he would have gone to Jerusalem. He had obviously come to the conclusion that Jehovah was the true God. He was obeying the Old Testament commands to come to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. And you know there were commands that required all the men of Israel to come three times a year to worship in Jerusalem. This was a man who was not doing what the Muslims do, try to make one ritual going to Mecca in their lifetime so that they can add Hajj to their name. This was a man who had finished his Jerusalem pilgrimage. He's on his way back home. It wasn't a matter of the experience at Jerusalem, which is what opened his eyes, because this is after his experience. But his trip to Jerusalem had produced an deeper, even deeper desire to study the Word of God. I think that gives us the indicator that experience is not the key. The question is the Scripture and Christ. You know, perhaps the reason he came from Ethiopia, there's an ancient tradition that the Queen of Sheba had a son by Solomon and thus a connection to the royal line to Jerusalem. That dates back several thousand years. That son, according to that tradition, was named Menelik, the son of Solomon and Queen of Sheba. And those of you who are old enough remember Haile Selassie, the last emperor of Ethiopia, who claimed direct descent from Solomon and the Queen of Sheba and bore the title Lion of the Tribe of Judah. He is not, of course, nor will any one of that line, if it exists, be the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. Our Lord Jesus Christ owns that title. But here is a man who had come to Judaism because of some contact with the Old Testament scriptures and had come to believe that Jehovah was the true and living God. He had in his portion, or in his position, at least a portion of the Hebrew scriptures. Principle number nine, that brings us to the ninth principle in the text, is God always uses his word to draw people to Christ. Today is Reformation Sunday. We celebrate the fact that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The just shall live by faith. Faith is not some kind of ambiguous thing that floats out there nebulously in the universe and you sort of every now and then get an emanation of faith. Faith is complete confidence in the word of God. The word of God is central to salvation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And here is a man who is not merely reading it silently, he's reading out loud. He's hearing the word of God coming from his own voice. Sitting there in the chariot with the scroll of Isaiah and reading the word of God. Principle nine is that God always uses his word to draw people to Christ. It was not his conversion to Judaism that brought him to Christ. It was not his pilgrimage to the temple that brought him to Christ. It was the reading of the scriptures that God used to bring him to Christ. That brings us to principle number 10. The scriptures are essential, but principle 10, God frequently uses strategically placed people at critically spiritual turning points in our lives. Let me say that again. God frequently uses strategically placed people at the critically spiritually important 
turning points in our lives. Last week, and I mentioned it a moment ago, we saw how God had a precise person at a precise time, starting at a precise location, traveling at a precise speed over a precise route, for a precise intersection at another precise location, with a precise individual who was engaged in a precise activity, reading a precise passage of scripture at the exact moment of the intersection. He wasn't reading descriptions of the division of the land of Israel, far, what is it, uh, four east at Parbar, four west at Parbar. You know, he wasn't reading a passage like that. He was reading Isaiah 53. Who do you think it was that motivated him to take that scroll, to open to that specific portion of scripture, and then to begin to ask himself questions about it. I hope that when you read the Bible, you ask questions. As I study scripture every morning, I have a, a very precise kind of an activity that I do in the morning to get the, the largest mix of different portions of scripture that I can so that I will see different portions of scripture interacting with one another two out of the Old Testament, two out of the New Testament, and done in a very specific kind of rotation so that eventually I will see every passage that I read in the Old Testament in contrast with every other passage of the Old Testament and every passage that I read in the New Testament in contrast with those passages that I've read in the Old Testament. And it is amazing what God does as I ask questions. Now, this seems to be talking about that. Now, I wonder about this, and I wonder about that. And then I begin to do word studies, and I begin to, to, to see if there's a quotation here. Is this an illusion? If so, are there other illusions? I remember three days ago I read in such and such a chapter, and I look back there. And if you looked at my Bible, you would see the notes are plastered all over the margins. You probably can't see it from there. I just flipped over here. This second Chronicles, you can see red and green and blue and yellow. And then down the side margins, there are things in pencil. There are things in pen. Some's black, some's blue, some is red. In fact, some of it has been there for so long that the sweat of my thumb has actually blurred some of those passages there. But I write down my comments here. And then as I go back later and study it, and then I read the comments, then that brings back other things to mind that I may have just read previously. Oh, people, ask yourselves questions as you read scripture. Ask questions that have meaning about the text. Instead of just skipping over, well, I don't understand that, so you go on. Or, hmm, wonder what that word means, and then you read the next passage. Look them up. Study them. Here's a man who was doing that. He was asking questions. He's reading through this. He says, I don't understand this. Who's going to be able to tell me about this? Suddenly this guy shows up. Bang. He says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? How can I unless some man explains it to me? Hey, come on up here. Tell me about this. You'll never know what kind of opportunities God will open up for you if you are open for the opportunity. Principle number 10. God frequently uses strategically placed people at critical spiritual turning points in our lives. That brings us to number 11. And this is one that ties in with what I've just been saying, but which most of us are not willing to follow. Principle number 11. Those with a true desire for the word are willing to overcome all obstacles so that they might absorb the word. Those who with a true desire for the word are willing to overcome all obstacles so that they can absorb the word. Notice what it says here. It says he was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. He wasn't sitting in a comfortable armchair in his living room. He was not in a quiet library. This was a banging and jarring, noisy chariot. He was not in an air-conditioned Mercedes with air ride suspension and high-tech sound-absorbing insulation. He was in a bumpy chariot riding over a desert road. Now, some of you are here when we've shown these various missionary videos on Wednesday evening. Um, think about the missionary videos that we showed recently from Frontline Missions about the unpaved roads 
in Ethiopia. That's where this man was from. That's where he was going back to. Those roads, as you will recall from seeing the videos, are very hard even for four-wheel drive vehicles to navigate. You saw the vehicles getting stuck in some of those places. You saw once when they were out there trying to drill wells that the big well drilling rig got stuck in the sand. And they had to get the whole tribe out there to help shove it out of the sand as its wheels were spinning and throwing sand everywhere. Now stop about and think of a chariot in the desert. Now suppose somebody might say, well, yeah, but this was Roman times. Maybe the Romans built a road. Okay, let's say if this was a Roman cobblestone road, it would have been even bumpier and noisier. Chairs didn't have struts. Chairs didn't have modern shock absorbers. For the most part, they were open to the elements, grit and dust, and sand blowing into your eyes and nose and mouth. And I lived in Israel, and I've been through some of the sandstorms that are there. It was very unpleasant. Those of you who saw those videos that go down into Ethiopia saw the little dust devils whirling across and you saw that one situation where there's a shepherd with his entire flock and this dust devil absorbs them, just goes right over them. And you don't see them as they're enclosed in this thing. That's what's traveling through the devil is, that desert is like. Here's the Ethiopian eunuch. It is desert. The chariot is obviously traveling at some speed because, as we mentioned, Philip had to run to catch up to it. Now, question. I know that you can all answer yes to this. Have any of you ever tried to read while driving in a car? Yes. We've all tried that, haven't we? But even in a modern car, it's not easy on a bumpy road. Very soon you get tired. Very soon you want to put the book down. Which brings us to the next principle. Remember, this is the principle. Those with a true desire for the word are willing to overcome all obstacles so that they can absorb the word. Principle 12. God does not give us specific direction until we obey his general directions. Philip has traveled quickly and faithfully obeyed God's general directions, and now God gives him the specific directions. He traveled a long route by foot. He traveled over a period of days. He traveled in difficult physical conditions and probably difficult weather first. God did not outline the objective to Philip concerning his trip or any details while he was in Samaria. God told him to go, and he started moving immediately. That takes us back to principle one and the corollaries to that principle. When God gives us direction, here's the corollary one. Obey first, ask questions later. And a second corollary principle, delayed obedience is disobedience. When you know the will of God and when you delay, it's not a matter of delay, it's a matter of disobedience. Principle 13, God always removes the obstacles that we would normally think of as insurmountable. God always removes the obstacles that we would normally think are insurmountable. Think about this for a minute. Stop and think about who this guy is, this man, and the location in which Philip meets him. This man is the treasurer of an entire nation. He is the treasurer of a queen. He is a highly important official of state. Have any of you ever tried to get an interview with, say, President Obama? What kind of reception do you think you would get when you made application for that? Think you'd get in to see him? Suppose he was driving through town. Do you think you could run up to the side of his car, even if it was driving slowly, and bang on the window and have him roll it down? Do you not think that there might be a few of these guys, you know, with the black glasses and the little funny thing in their ear and, you know, this bulge on the side of their coat pocket that as it flashes open you see a pistol inside there and they have a little tiny pin that shows they're part of the Secret Service. Do you think that a man of this stature is going to be traveling hundreds of miles through the desert without any kind of guard? 
We absolutely know that he had a, a charioteer, a man driving the chariot. Uh, I mean, he wasn't like some of us today. You know, uh, we're sitting there talking on our cell phone as we drive, or we're busy trying to text and drive at the same time, or trying to read a book as we're driving. You know, he at least had a charioteer with him. We know that because it says he commanded the chariot to stop just before he's baptized. He didn't have some kind of automatic voice module control whereby he spoke and then the thing, you know, gradually slowed down and disengaged the transmission and rolled to a precise stop. There was at least one other guy there. Stop and think about this. The one other guy would have also overheard the conversation. It wasn't like he was dragging a chariot that was 45 feet behind where he was riding, up on some horses way, way up here in the front, you know, like those big, long borax mule trains. 40-team borax. I don't know if you remember those commercials back in the 50s. Here's somebody else who's listening in. When you and I are ready to give an answer to every man that asketh us, a reason of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear, you never know who also is listening in. But I suspect that this man, with his authority, going through a desert road, and the roads back then are just like roads in Afghanistan or Pakistan or someplace like that today. They are covered over with bandits. He would have not been going alone and unarmed. We're coming up to Christmas time, quote unquote, which means that we'll read the story of the wise men. The wise men were the, we call them the wise men, the Magoi, were the kingmakers of Persia. We see Christmas cards, and there are three very ornately and richly dressed guys with fancy jeweled crowns made out of gold and diamonds and stuff studded on their heads riding across the desert on camels. That's how the Christmas cards portray them. Can you imagine riding over a thousand miles through the Middle East, dressed like that, with all kinds of gold and jewelry showing and big boxes full of gold hanging on your sides, and not be the temptation of every bandit in every city that you went through? No, these would have been men traveling with a large retinue. And that's why when they show up on the horizon of Jerusalem, it says, Herod in all Jerusalem was troubled with him. Because Herod had tried to take a chunk out of the Persian Empire just a few years earlier with Mark Anthony, and the Persian horsemen, the greatest horsemen in the world, had defeated the Roman legions and driven them back with their tails between their legs. And suddenly, here are the kingmakers of Persia, Sending a message, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Herod was an Idumean Arab. He was not born king of the Jews. He had gotten that by bribery and royal appointment. And he thinks to himself, they're here to start trouble because of what we just did. They're here to try to dethrone me. And so Herod doesn't volunteer to go with them down to Bethlehem. He says, go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. He didn't dare budge out of Jerusalem. People of that rank and status traveling through the Middle East do not travel alone without armed bodyguards. And yet Philip, because the Holy Spirit tells him to do it, is able to run up alongside the chariot. He's close enough to hear what the man is reading. He's close enough to talk to him. The chariot is open. Nobody stops him. Nobody grabs him and frisks him to see if he has a dagger. Does that not seem strange to you? And God has prepared the man's heart. When Philip asks him the question, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I understand unless some man explains it to me? And he invites Philip into the chariot. And Philip preaches Christ. When it is God's will, and he has an obedient servant, 
who is doing what he has called him to do and has done it immediately, God can penetrate even the most formidable defenses which are surrounding a man that God wants to reach with the gospel. That is true for every man and woman in our federal government, state government, municipal government, county governments, God can reach them. And there will be no gatekeepers who keep the doors closed. I think it's a magnificent, beautiful picture. Philip could see him, Philip could hear what he was reading, Philip knew the passage. And notice something else. Philip understood him and he understood Philip. He must have been reading in Hebrew if he was reading Isaiah. God had prepared this man not only to learn whatever the Ethiopian language of that time was, today Amharic, but who knows what it was at that time. But he's reading in Hebrew. This is a man who had studied more than one language and was capable of reading and communicating in it because he was reading a Hebrew text. And so Philip approaches, speaks in Hebrew, and explains to him Christ. Great message. Money, missions, and divine direction. Oh, what God can do when he wants to do it if we are simply willing and if we are immediately obedient. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the beauty of your word. As we picture this scene in our minds and see how you are working out details and drawing two men together as they travel across barren wilderness land, one man alone and on foot, another man with at least some people with him, one traveling quickly, one traveling slowly, one with the message of Christ, one with the word of God that he does not understand. Philip, join yourself to this chariot and your specific direction that a man might share Christ and that another man might believe. A man who would change a nation. Father, we thank you for your sovereign wisdom, your sovereign plan, and your willingness to use the so-called insignificant people to do things that may not seem important at the time, but which have eternal consequences. Make us that kind of people, each of us individually, as a group, corporately, that we are immediately obedient when we hear your word, understand your word, and understand how it applies to us. Teach us to obey. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.